you're gonna hear a lot about this network, VGG, VGG16, VGG19. So, so far we collect, we covered AlexNet, network in network, and this one is VGG. Very deep convolutional networks for large scale image recognition. That's the paper. And uh, this is usually the type of figures you are that you're gonna find in papers. That's actually a table. So what was nice about this paper was that they said you don't need to use 11 by 11 convolutions or seven by seven convolutions or five by five. You can get away with using three by three convolutions and then going deeper. Because if you have two uh, con three by three convolutions, basically three by three convolutions are stacked on top of each other in your layers, that's equivalent to a con five. So it's receptive field is gonna be five by five. So they said rather than working with five by five convolutions, seven by seven convolutions, you are gonna to stick to convolution that are three by three, but then stack them on, on top of each other and go deeper. They started with 11 layers. That's their configuration one. The input is gonna be a 200 24 by 224 red, green, blue image. So the dimension of your X input is gonna be 224 by 224 by three. Then you put a convolution three by three and your dimension now changes from three, the number of channels to 64. Then the number of channels increase to 128 to 256, 512, and then in the end, the max pooling and the fully connected layers and soft max. So if these guys are not using global average pooling, uh, it's because these papers were usually written around the same time. Okay. Is this table showing us multiple configurations like that's like column a is a configuration and column a lrn yes, yes. so i cover uh, column a now and an image goes in and then whenever you have a max pooling the stride is going to be two so you're reducing your uh, resolution so after this max pooling the resolution is going to be one 12, so 112 by 112 after this max pooling. So the idea is that you reduce the resolution and at the same time you increase the number of channels. The other question, the other question I had was um, you'd said that doing two convolutions with a three by three is the same as a convolution with a five by five. Mm -hmm. It seems like the number of free parameters there doesn't match up. Like I can agree that the width of, what did you call it, the field um, would be the same, but you'd only have 18 free parameters versus 25. So it obviously can't be the same thing. Uh, that depends on your, because everything is gonna be a tensor. You're forgetting about the third dimension. Got it. You can increase the number of parameters by increasing the number of channels. They are not totally equivalent, but the receptive field is gonna be the same. And then usually there is gonna be a nonlinearity after your convolution, or there is gonna be batch normalization, which we are gonna cover later on. So they are not totally equivalent, but in terms of receptive field, they have the same receptive field. And receptive field is each convolution is looking at what area of your image. Okay. 
Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. There is another configuration. Uh, this is the same. And the only change from A to ALRM is LRM, which I'm gonna cover soon, but the rest of it is the same in terms of width and depth, they are the same networks except for, so the paper wanted to study the effect of LRM. And LRM is a method that uh, AlexNet also used. So they wanted to study the effect of it, whether it's actually necessary or not. Then there is conv, convmet B, this configuration, this has three weight layers. So whenever you want to count the depth of your network, you count only the ones that are parameterized. So you don't count max poolings because they don't have any parameters. But your convolutions have parameters and you're counting the number of convolutions. In this case, it's gonna be 13 layers deep. For instance, you don't count your activations. If you have ReLU, you're not counting that as a layer. Only the weighted ones, wherever you have parameters. The other one is 16. The configurations C and D are the same, except for use of conv1 versus conv3, but the rest of it is the same. This is VGG 16 that most people use, and this is gonna be VGG 19. This has 19 layers and it's filled with conv3 all the time. And it has 19 weighted layers. But what is LRM? It stands for local response normalization. What is the role of that? It's to mimic what's hap what is happening inside our eyes or inside our brain when an image goes in. The idea is that you want to create a competition for big activities between your uh, neuron outputs. How do you do that? There is the activity of a neuron by kernel I at position X and Y. So X and Y is gonna be your pixel, A is gonna be your pixel value at channel I. Uh, but you get the idea. Everything in convolutions are gonna be tensors it has three entries, X, Y, and I. And then you divide it by a, a term to get you the activity that is normalized. But what is that? What is this term doing? Let's say you want to fix the response normalized activity. You want to have the same fixed normalized activity to have the same activity, if one of these guys increase the activity in any other channel, let's say channel J increases by a little bit, if you, if you want to maintain the same level of B, you have to increase the activity in channel I. And this is just in a neighborhood of channel I. If in a neighborhood of channel I, the activity of a channel increases, the activity of this guy should also increase. So that's how you create a competition for big activity. And these are the actual values that the paper uses. AlexNet uses the same values and this paper is using the same values. The thing is this paper studied the effect of LRM and compared it with A, A versus A LRM, and they didn't notice any big difference. So after this paper, people stopped using LRM. 
but when we go, I'm introducing this idea because later on when we uh, deal with uh, generative adversarial neural networks, these ideas are coming back. And they are coming back in a different form for ideas of layer normalization for recurrent neural networks. So it's a good idea to introduce this idea here, despite the fact that for image classification, this is sort of obsolete. People don't use that anymore. So that's how you create a competition between activities. Because think about it, in your filters, in your channels, uh, nearby pixels are talking to each other in your neural network, but nearby channels are not talking to each other. This is a way of enforcing that constraint so that they talk to each other channel-wise. Yeah, I'm waiting for questions. If there are no questions, we can move on. There is a question from Blake. Is LRN useful for generalization between data sets? Say two image data sets with different pre-processing. Uh, I haven't seen that being used between data sets. So whenever you have two data sets, that's the idea of transfer learning. And we are gonna cover that later on in this course. But I haven't seen people use that for transfer learning. But think this is happening per layer. This is not just the input image. So this is the activity per one of the layers. And they do it per layer. Any other questions? Another idea that Alex Net was using, and almost all of the papers in uh, computer vision use, that's data augmentation. Because even a data as big as ImageNet with 1.2 million images is not big enough. So they try to augment the data. If you have a, the image of a tiger inside your image, and if you shift the tiger up and down or left and right, the label, the class is still a tiger. So that doesn't change. And we know that convolutions sort of do that, but they do it locally. They do it for a small shift to the right or a small shift to the left, but not for big shifts up and down. The other thing is that if you take the same image and you look at it in the mirror, the image of a tiger, look at it in the mirror, it's still a tiger. That's why they usually increase the size of their data by image translations, which is basically random crops. Uh, ImageNet images are 256 by 256. Uh, and they usually take a, sorry, at least one of the dimensions is 256. The other dimension could be something else. Uh, they take 224 by 224 crops, random crops of those images, and they put that inside the neural network. So each image is now gonna be, end up being 10 more images. This way you increase the size of your data set. The other one is horizontal reflect, reflection, which is basically looking at the same image in a mirror. So you reflect it left to right. That's one type of data augmentation. Another more complicated one, which other than the AlexNet paper and this paper, very few other papers are using it, but it's good to know about it. You can, uh, so object and basically object identity, for instance, the image being the image of a tiger is invariant to changes in the intensity and color of the illumination. So it doesn't matter whether you, take, you took that image during day 
or during night or in the evening or under artificial light. It is still a tiger. And the way that you do it is to alternate the intensity of the red, green, blue channels in your training images. So the vector of red, green, blue per pixel is going to be three dimensional. You can find the covariance matrix of that three dimensional vector. That's going to be three by three because that's a covariance matrix of a vector in R3 of a three dimensional vector. You compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then you randomly crop your image that way. So it's sort of like doing PCA on your data and then randomly shifting it left and right. And this is going to give you different illuminations. The other one is scale jittering. What does it mean? Uh, you have one image. That image, for instance, ImageNet data set, the smaller side is going to be 256. That's the number of pixels, I don't know, in your X coordinate or in your Y coordinate. Depending on whether your image is a landscape or a portrait, you're going to have different type different size for your smaller side. Rather than using 256, you can say that I want to rescale my data, rescale my image, so that the smaller scale is a number between, I don't know, 256 and 124. And then you can feed in different scales into your neural network. This technique, they usually use it for testing. You can also use it during training. When they submit their results to the ImageNet channel challenge, um, it's usually multiple images. They test it on multiple images and they average it. So they have the same image they test it on multiple scales. Sorry, that's the better way of putting it. So you test your neural network on multiple scales and then you, in the end, report the average. So any questions about data augmentation? I have a quick question about the intensity alteration mm -hmm. um, and just this equation. So you're saying the, the, the pixel at a point x, y is its initial value plus some stuff here in this covariance matrix is so you have like a three by three like a three by three matrix centered at x y or i'm a little confused about this last part i guess so let's look at it this way your gaussian is gonna have mean zero if mean is zero, it means that one of the samples could be very close to zero or actually zero if alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are zero. You're doing nothing to your pixel value. Yeah, so I, yeah, I get the, the Gaussian there. I guess I'm confused about the where these eigenvectors and eigenvalues are coming from. Like what, how do we build the covariance matrix? So there is a lot of details that I'm not going through. So you need to know a little bit more about computer vision and how the covariance matrix correlates with illumination and intensity of the illumination. But are we just taking a, so are we looking at like one channel? So if we're looking at like the red channel and then we look at a three by three sort of. No. So you are looking at one pixel but in three channels, mm -hmm. red, green, and blue. 
this is your vector at x and y location. Mm -hmm. And then across your image, you can compute the covariance matrix across x and y pixels. Now, if you have, I don't know, 256 by 256, how many numbers is that going to be? 256 by 256 numbers you have. It means that you can find the covariance. Okay. It's going to be empirical covariance of that particular image. But then not only you do it per pixel, you compute that covariance, you compute it across your data set as well. And that's gonna be a three by three covariance matrix. Because some of the images in ImageNet are gonna be taken in daylight. Some of them are taken at night. Some of them are taken in the evening of different uh, identities or entities under different illumination conditions. This covariance is gonna tell you how these are correlated to each other. And uh, in the end, what you're gonna get for this pixel is gonna be a Gaussian with this mean and some uh, perturbation of that, which is coming from the correlation matrix, the covariance matrix. Okay, yeah, I think I get it. I think the part I was confused about was uh, th this three by three matrix is you're building from like the the two vectors, this like with your three channels at a specific pixel. Uh, no, so per each pixel, you have a three-dimensional vector. Yeah. Now the cool thing is that you have many pixels and then you have many pixels in your data set. It means that you can compute your covariance. And this is empirical covariance. It means that the covariance is coming from your data. Okay. I think to answer this simply, it's the, it's the covariance among all pixels in the image. Exactly. There is a question. Is there a way to know which augmentation method to use? Specifically between translation like sliding, mirroring, scaling, etc. Should you only use one or should you combine these methods? That depends on the size of your data and the complexity of the task. If your data set is very small, then probably you're going to need a lot of data augmentation for your neural network not to overfit. The cool thing about data augmentation is that you're increasing the size of your data for free. So if your data set is very small compared to the complexity of the task, then you need to do more of these data augmentations. So I don't have a definite answer to your question. It comes from experience. Even ImageNet is not big enough compared to the complexity of the task. So you need to do a lot of data augmentation. And actually, AlexNet is doing all of these data augmentations. I'm not sure about the scale jittering. They do it for testing, but I'm not sure during training. But this paper definitely is using a scale jittering. So these are the, the sort of thing, these techniques that are usually glossed over. But I'm including them here because they are really important if you actually want to practice uh, deep learning in computer vision. So data augmentation is very important. And people use it in various uh, forms and in various quantities. Some people use it a lot, some people use it less, maybe just random crops is enough and horizontal reflection. But uh, I would say number one is very important. Almost all of the papers that I've read do that. 
Does that answer your question, Brandon? Any other questions? So a couple of nice techniques here to, to recap. It was the introduction and use of three by three convolutions. It was the idea of going deeper. There is these ideas of data augmentation and local response normalization that are coming from Alex net paper and are also used here. There is another topic is the way these guys train it. These are very deep networks. And at that time, some of the techniques that we know these days were not available, but these are good ideas to know about. They started with network A because it is less deep, it's easier to train, it has 11 weight layers. So they train this, they warm start the training of A LRN with those weights, they retrain and basically fine tune. They take those weights, they put it here. Some of them are new, some of them are the same. So these are new, these are gonna be initialized randomly. And then they retrain, 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 and then in the end, VGG19 is trained. And if you think about it, this is sort of transfer learning. We are transferring and then fine tuning. You're transferring your parameters. Any other questions? 